It gives me great pleasure to now introduce a session called uh, Predicting Narratives. Um, and this is what I wrote, which was, again, really a, a prompt. And I have every hope that um, Nadine and Ahad and uh, Shuang uh, will uh, have kind of strayed from this as, as much as they feel is necessary. But the sort of questions that I wanted to pose to them was, what's the relationship between identity and heritage? Does technology elicit new narratives of the self and of the nation state? And what is the resolution of truth? Um, in my own humble opinion, I think Ahad al Moody and Shuang Li are two of today's most exciting young artists. And I think we've just had a, a sort of mini discussion about what young might possibly mean today. And so there's probably, um, it's a contestable term, but nevertheless, I'll still use it here. They weave novel, witty narratives based around their cultures, um, Saudi Arabian and Chinese respectively, articulated in the native languages of online characters. Um, and to chart the uh, choppy waters of their work, we have somebody who will be familiar to many of you, um, the great uh, writer and critic, Nadine Khalil. So will you please w uh, welcome Nadil and uh, Shuang and uh, Ahad. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shimon. I love the way you combine my first and last name. <laughs> well, yesterday we talked a lot about um, the change of change. And yes, we have changed uh, the blurb that you initially prompted us with. Um, so the title of our talk today is called Predicting Narratives. And we're going to look at both personal and collective identities in flux through the eyes of Shuang Li and Ahad al Um by kind of zeroing in on how technology narrates cultures but also goes beyond it and um, looking at you know this element of fiction and and how um, both Ahed and Shuang though their works are very different but through the moving image they really um, create lenses for um, a kind of outlook on the technological self and body the voice the image, and this idea of the past. Um, so I'll just introduce uh, both of you, and then we can proceed. Uh, Shuang Li was born in southeast China in a small town um, where she was influenced by video game culture and punk and emo music. Uh, she studied in New York, and ever since the pandemic, she kind of got stuck uh, outside China and now is based between Berlin and Geneva. Um, her work looks at globalized communication systems, but also what I find really interesting is this idea of shifting media landscapes that we just referenced earlier uh, through the lens of machinic intimacies. And just to give you an example, um, there's a work that she did called If Only the Cloud Knows, which took form on an interactive website where all her digital files from the last 10 years, text and photos, uh, you know, she kind of invited people to delete them, uh, whatever they wanted, as long as they left a note. Uh, and then she would delete them also from her backup copy. Um, Ad al um was raised between the UK and Saudi Arabia, and uh, I think is based in Jeddah now, right? And works with photography, print, uh, video, sculpture, and I guess is kind of a witness to what's happening, the you know escalating changes in Saudi Arabia. I remember the first time I visited uh, Ahad's uh, studio six years ago. It was my first time in Saudi Arabia. And she had videos of men wearing thobes break dancing to Michael Jackson. And you know there was also someone wearing a pomegranate print outfit, um, singing an old song from the 60s, Oh Pomegranate, which has been like reinterpreted in many shapes and forms. And so there's a lot of satire uh, in Ahed's uh, work, uh, but it kind of is, is trying to capture this change that's beyond capture, I guess. And so I would love to start with Shuang. And uh, yes, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Nadine, for your introduction. So, um, yeah, my I actually have a background in media studies. I didn't go to art school, so my work actually explores um, the globalized and simulated digitalized communication systems. Um, the most recent work that I did was a collaboration with um, the brand Miu Miu. So while it takes one click for a message, 
an emoji, a video to fly to the other side of the world. The communication systems that makes it happen um, is a volatile mix of metal, precom, heat, industrial cooling systems, fuel, fantasy of proximity, silicone, undersea cables, hydropower plants, green lights, and etc. I always wonder where do lost messages go? Lost in translation, lost in the glitches of technology, lost in thoughts and prayers, lost in cable landing sites. And here's a clip of the show. To whom it might concern, I have been trying to find ways to talk to you, but the good old face-to-face -face is out of date. Body is forbidden, and where shut the gate? The first... Now words are bloated, and images are dead. So I get in that cable that goes to yesterday, but it was never actually landed, and the building had been turned into an escape room. Um, together with architects at OMA, um, we designed a show with undersea cables as city, while lost messages turn into planets. Audience and models walk between the stars. These messages might have been lost, but we can see the stars that have, they've turned into, even though we can never reach them. And the voiceover we heard is a monologue that I wrote as a uh, message that got lost during all this communication, and it was trying to find its way to the destination. Um, body, another, another big um, theme of my practice is the relationship between body and screen. Um, this year, I've come to observe that the relationship between the two has been reversed. So before we have body first, like physical body, and then we have uh, uh, we have representation throughout different mediums, such as painting and photography. But these days, if we don't have a screen body, it feels like the physical body will probably disappear too. Without a body, you can turn into a black pixel. Unlike Prometheus, who stole fire for you, I give you this pixel. I give you the possibility to live any life you have ever craved for. You look into the mirror, but can no longer see yourself. You would think the brightness of the sun has blinded you but it's actually that one tiny pixel. It has covered the pupil before you know it. This pixel turns your body into a clear mirror. A clear mirror gathers no dust, reflects no beams. From now on, you can't look into your own eyes. The only thing you can see right now is your own shadow. You sigh in relief. After all, what's more uncanny than your own image? Definition is not verisimilitude or realism, and realism is not reality. You would think the definition of fire is combustion, but it's actually the non-combustion of it. As a fire cannot burn another fire, and just like a clear mirror also cannot reflect another mirror, the realism of you now is your shadow. Without a body, you have turned into a black pixel. Unlike Prometheus, who stole fire for you, I give you this pixel. 
I give you the possibility to live any life you ever craved for. You start to remember when you were in the womb, warm and moist. You become so comfortable in your shadow, maybe too comfortable. You sink into the bottom of the ocean, turning into an octopus. His cracked iPhone in passerby's hands. The lonely aisle in the supermarket with a mop in the middle to clean up an accident. The public bathroom in a gas station covered in graffiti. Some smother, then some fill, someone back to the village. You can choose to watch or to participate. Eat with your eyes. What used to be edible is slowly turning little. When I grow up, I want to be a detector. And I will execute anybody who shows the tiny tendency um the video we just watched was called it's called either per object and it was initially commissioned by rockbell museum in shanghai so um, in this video, I believe that bio body is a concept of the past, is nostalgia. With bodies made of pixels, you can be whoever you want or not.第一天培训内容是关键词网络从初中学校旁边的小网吧里开始编织直男这个词第一次出现在我手机屏幕上
工作时候，总会有些人让我给他们推荐袜子。他们中有些人应该是想要讨好男朋友的女孩，应该是想讨好男朋友的女孩。我一般只会发给他们我被主妇要主妇要多卖的那几个款式，但有些时候我也会收到这样的问题：你自己也穿这些袜子吗？能不能给我试？我让他们买袜子，自己完成绩效，拿到奖金。操，这双袜子还能让我干成多少事啊？点都不能少，朝九晚五创业，处女膜、权威、腿毛、西川结衣、无金，耐心没有耐心，冈本、宝马、妈宝，征服、自由、统治、沉默、胡子，没有胡子，自我、部队、自我、整容、部队、整容。The video we just watched was a, a is an earlier work of mine that was in two thousand made in two thousand seven eighteen. Um, so it depicts a straight uh, cis straight man's experience as an online customer service. So on the first day, his boss told him, "From now on, you have to start thinking、uh, talking like a girl." When you are sweet and soft like a girl, the customers will like you more, and you will sell more. But I don't. But I'm a man," he said. To which his boss answered, "From now on, you have no gender."、Um, so the images they come from、uh, the images of the video they come from some online foot fetish video that I found, and、um, I work with an animator to animate them. Um, this layer anim- of animation somehow makes it into a genderless state.、Um, death of image as we know it, just like the death of bio body, image as we know it has also come to its own demise amidst circulations. In my work, I use a lot of stock footage and images. So the upcoming clip we're gonna watch is a music video for my friend、uh, Oshayak. He's a musician that I collaborated with a lot. He's also the one who made the music for Miu Miu, and the one the video we just watched.、Um, so for the song, he used this program that the Japan Japan Idol use, like those、uh, holograms that the. Yeah, the digital idols, and they use this program to generate the voice. So in this song, there is only one voice,、uh, one line generated by this program, and it just keeps repeating. Do you still even care? And for the image, I just used、um, t- like different, like a, a lot of stock footages, and they just keep morphing each o- into each other. <laughs> Physicality as nostalgia, as Nadine mentioned, I grew up in a、um, in a small town in southeast part of China. It was very boring.、Um, <laughs> I had nothing to do, so <laughs> all that I did、um, was playing video games, like on, get online, read books. I had this、um, yeah very love and hate relationship with physicality. So during that period of time. Um, I think that that planted the seeds of my earlier works. That's mostly immaterial and like digital, because I wanted to escape not just the immediate surrounding, but also my own body. But、um, during pandemic, when I was stuck in Europe and when I was like locked out of my own home country. Um, I was moving a lot because I didn't have an apartment. And one night I was moving into a new、uh, a new apartment for the month. It was like a compound. It has like sound sound activating light. And I moved in like 9 p.m. And when I was like going into the compound with like my suitcase, the entire、um, light just like lit up for me. Um, that was a very epiphany moment that I only saw that I saw my shadow, and that's when I was like, 
while I can never, you know, really escape my body, it's actually just me and my body. Um, so during pandemic, I've actually started to work a lot with physical, uh, physical and like materials. And in my show, Nobody's Home at Perez Project, I constructed a home that's decaying um, with moving images, installation, and sculptures. Um, for me, to make physical works feels like visiting the past. In some way, like something once physical is built, it can only be meant for a um, decade or hopefully also a new beginning. Hi, everyone. Um, so for the presentation today, just to clarify, I am present Ahad. Um, and Marif is a, to be تعرف عن نفسك if you want to tell us who you are. وأنا مستقبل عهد. But in your present and in my past. Okay, shukran مستقبل عهد. Um, so the works that I'm going to be sharing with you guys today are centered around the notion of a vision or some sort of collision. Um, and a restrain, a restaging or a restructuring of a narrative that's that's given, that affects both present Ahad and Mustaqbal Ahad, and that's why both of us are here today presenting this presentation to you. The first work that I'm going to be talking about is a work that's currently playing in the back. It's called Limayar Fasagar Ishwi, and it translates to those who don't know falcons grill them. And it, it's basically a um, Bedouin saying, which means if you don't understand something, sometimes you tend to mis misuse it. And it was created in 2018, around the time uh, a lot of announcements for the changes that were happening in Saudi were being announced. And, and at that time, I felt a sense of groundlessness, and I was searching for some sort of grounding and uh, I started working with these khabeti performers. And khabeti is a traditional dance uh, that men used to perform in preparation for war. They'd get into this like trance and um, instill fear in the enemy's uh, hearts as well. So it was really interesting for me, this dance in particular, because I was really interested in how the body itself in its motion became or started to become distorted or this like notion of like an illusion of distortion or a blur. And I wanted to play around with that. So in the video um, piece itself, you see the men either flying or falling, but you never really see them landing anywhere. And it, uh, to me kind of represented how everything at the time felt very much up in the air and we questioned a lot of the things or our position uh, within, you know, spaces that are in flux or landscapes that are in flux in general. I don't know, Ahad al-Mustaqbal, is it change? Like, what do you think of change? التغيير التغيير change is good change is change is good positive positive change change is good positive positive change great thank you um so the next piece that I'm going to talk about is a piece called Neon, and it was a response to Neom, a new city that's being built at the outskirts of Saudi Arabia and a city called Tabuk. Um, and uh, it was done, just to give you an understanding of when it was created, it was done just before the announcement of the line was, was made, and we had um, only information that was put on a website. It was like a manifesto of what Neon was going to be or what it aimed to be, and um, there was a few ads and videos that came out as well during that time. And this piece is a collaboration between me and the artist you see on, in the screen, Michael Mogensen. And we created these two characters called Neon 1 and Neon 2, and both of them basically want the future now. They want it for themselves. And we also created this structure called RD that housed them and sheltered them. She's an AI structure. And RD is a play on words. Um, it's, um, you know, RD, RD, which translates to my land. And throughout the video, you see them struggle with the basic necessities of life, shelter, food, um, language 
And um, so I, I shot these two videos, the Falcon piece and this piece during the same time. And the Falcon was a reaction to this change. And this piece was more of me trying to gain control of the narrative and claim it as mine in some way. Um, a small clip will play now of the video. Over to you, Fard. Ah, now where has Fard gone? Energy and water. Mobility. Biotechnology. Entertainment. Technology. No, no, no. Technology. Manufacturing. Is the future for everyone. As it was once said, not everyone will be taken into the future. So Neon 1 and Neon 2 wanted it for themselves. They want to be a part of it. They want what it promises. So they decided to lay their claim to stake out their homestead. Um, this next piece is called Makwaman. I'm going to talk about it, but I'm just going to let it play for a little bit and then I'll talk about the piece itself. Hey, I'm going to start with a song and I'm going to talk. I'm in the mood. I'm in the mood. I'm going to say that. قلت بقول للناس شيء علي قلت بستخبى من الشمس بجيب شمسية ها دائما كده خليك زي أبوك 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 هتلاقي ناس كتير حلوين ويساعدوك خليك زي اخوانك احد تاني غيرك حياخد مكانك كون زي الناس كون زي الناس كون زي الناس كون زي الناس so mukwaman was my attempt to challenge the roles of power or hegemony as a whole and um, I use a lot of signs and symbols within my work that carry different or heavy connotations, uh, usually stereotypical sim symbols of the region, whether it's a pomegranate or a falcon or the desert itself as a, some sort of context. And um, I became quite obsessed with the makwa. And I thought the, you know, the iron itself held, holds a lot of different connotations within the Arab region. Um, but for me, I started seeing it as a tool for change, whether it's bringing something to life or erasing, destroying, removing, depending on how you want to perceive that. And I worked with Hani Kadur, who you just heard um, on the video. And Hani is an amazing musician, screenwriter, uh, poet, and um, I basically staged him within this kind of scene and I gave him, I told him, you're in this position of power, tell us how to live our lives. And it was interesting to see him, um, how he kind of interpreted the role of power in general, so, and how he struggled with, you know, this silk, polyester, yellow fabric, and his yellow thobe and the iron, but also the role of power in itself. He it, he would tell us how to live our life, but in the process of that also it became internal. He questioned his role in life and he questioned his purpose and it became this in and out, which I never really expected from power to, to kind of, you know, to be betrayed in, this, in such a way. Um, but I really enjoyed how he interpreted it. I'm going to respond with a poem that I wrote. Um, it's called One Sight, One Eye. Sorry, One Sight, One Mind, One Eye. So one sight, one mind, one eye. Ya khi, ya khi saab. Kef ashuf al intibit shufu. Fahimuni bas kef ashuf al intibit shufu. How can I begin to see what you're seeing or what you see? 
Put yourself in my shoes. Fi jazmati, in your, my shoes. Put yourself in my shoes. You've been given a vision. A vision for a future that's being sold to you. And you have a deadline to achieve this vision, approximately 12 years, uh, for the overall vision to come into fruition. But to succeed, other visions need to come into fruition first. And all these smaller ones will build up to make a larger vision. And all this vision is not your vision. So how do you begin to navigate this existence or how do you begin to navigate this vision? Thank you, Mustaqbal Ahad. Um, after I became really obsessed with, you know, heat, pressure, and the makwa, the iron in itself, I think that led me into looking at the role and the, or the relationship between light and darkness and the performativity of light as a, as, as a subject, um, how it directs, misinforms, uh, di also distorts in some way. And I created this piece called The Green Light, and basically a group of 18 men on this pyramid plinth stand, and when green light is shone at them, they begin to scream at you or say this poem that uh, it's like a famous pop song that I changed slightly and then when the light is off they're quiet and they say nothing um, also a small clip they'll play now no! So after I worked on Green Light, I created this piece called Ghosts of Today and Tomorrow. And I felt that in the work, the Green Light, I gave a lot of power and a lot of attention to light, but I didn't give a voice to the darkness. And I felt quite sad about that. And I wanted uh, to give voice to those that are in the dark or darkness as a whole. And I created these two structures. And they're basically traditionally made pigeon towers uh, that house two majest performers that sing this poetry, a form of mawal. One represents light and the other represents darkness. And they, it's a b back and forth between the two. They, there's like tension, they're trying to prove their position, but by the end of it, light and darkness realize that they're absolutely in love, inseparable, and cannot exist without um, each other. And similar to the previous work. Exactly. Exactly, yes, thank you. Thank you, Ahad. Thank you, Ahad. Uh, so yeah, similar to the previous work, uh, when they start singing, the structure lights up, and when they're quiet, the structure is, is dark and dormant. Um, so this is kind of a quick overview of the works that I've been developing, and thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you both for offering this visual peek into your respective uh, universes, and I just got to thinking like when did when did vibe replace mood because i really felt that both of you <laughs> had us like delving into this overarching mood um i find it interesting that we kind of started with the Mew Mew fashion show and um almost ended with uh this choreography that you did in the desert and you know with pantone yellow and and i'm just thinking about the body um and the format in which you're showing the body, whether it's the music video, TikTok, or the fashion show, and how the body is related to the voice. And in, in both of your cases, you're using the voice in interesting ways. Um, I feel like, Shuang, you map these really emotional voices, but also very detached uh, male, and then you used your own voice in ether, but then you also distort it. And I had, I mean, you're quite well known for using actually uh, these imagined masculinities. And you do this through the lens of song or poetry rather than narrative, like Shuang. And so I just thought maybe you could both tell us a little bit more about how you're thinking about voice, language, song in your works. I mean, for my work, I use a lot of like pop songs. Um, because, or like songs in general, and uh, poetry that's known, because I feel like it's somewhat accessible. And I usually, um, 
I usually use a lot of men's voices or men a visualization of like a man in my work. And if it's a woman, then it's myself. And I think that's part of the reason of like how I perceive my space in general. I think if if I think of my country as a whole, and I think I think of the voice of the country as a whole, I think of a man's voice, and it's my way of. Um, changing or directing or restaging that narrative that's given to me. So I see it as my form of like superpower. Um, so. um, I think for me, voice in general is actually female, um, ironically, because I think with like Alexa, with all this like digitalized voice, they're also like all female and that's something what I'm used to. Actually like in line with my video where he, where that guy was told, if you're like talking like a girl, people will like you more. Um, that's how I feel in general. <laughs> um, yeah, I think like voice is definitely make, it's, it makes a work like accessible, like Asas Laha said, and then um, it can add to a lot of intimacy for me if it's a female voice. And then I just will have one more comment before we open it up. Um, I recently came across one of your works I had where you collaborate with another artist and it's called Hengli and it's this choreography again, talking about the mediation of the body but also the maneuvering of it in dance and performance. And uh, it's where you um, invent a language that can be understood by everyone and the banning of English, Arabic and Chinese in particular. I think your collaborator was also Chinese. Um, in order to uh, kind of create this transparent world where everyone can communicate. And I'm wondering, um, like, is that the past or is that the future for you, in a sense? Because I'm also thinking of this in relation to Schwang's idea of the past in which the images are dead, but also the body then is an image and a leaked image, you know, that kind of has this fluidity. And so I'm wondering what we can talk about in terms of the past and nostalgia and, and is the past dead or is it actually here? I mean, if anything, I think it represents the, pres the present to me. Um, the piece that you were referring to was a collaboration between me and uh, Meng Nada, uh, who's a choreographer and an artist. And um, we were reading a lot. Um, there was a text that we referenced a lot within the, the piece itself. It's uh, a text by Walter Benjamin, uh, the task of the translator. And he defines translation as the afterlife of the original. And if you think of the role of how the, my country right now is, it's like the change is happening within that space. And you think about what's lost and gained in this process of the change, and you start to question what's lost and gained in these process of movement. Um, I think that's how, how we try to define, um, you know, mistranslation or loss in translation or these kind of acts that occurred in the video itself and and we use the body we use the voice um to kind of define that i don't know if i've answered your question but i feel like i've just described what the work was um yeah i think um what i wanted to think about more is that it's it seems like the way you're depicting changes is this thing that's beyond one's grasp that someone can't re you can't really touch it so you either move to science fiction or you look at traditions in order to kind of encapsulate this change so it's almost like you're saying we can't really see it and that relates to you saying that um, you know you are, we are the shadow the pixel prevents us from being seen as a body you know and that's just something interesting I find in both of your works is this negation almost um, that's what I wanted to uh, speak more about I don't know if that was clear Shuang. Uh, in terms of, like, for example, with you, if the digital file is destroyed, is the memory destroyed, is the past destroyed, basically? Yeah, that's something what I wanted to find out through that work as well, because on, like, a bigger scale as, like, a Chinese person, um, the past is something you have to try really hard to remember, even if it's your only past, because the propaganda machine, they produce different narratives, like basically like gaslighting everyone into believing different things. So for me, the past is something you really have to try to remember. And I was always, always curious, like how, like if now we rely heavily on this external drive, uh, hard drives on the, 
on the phone, albums, on the text, on iCalendar, like, do we, can we actually remember again? Yeah, it's kind of like what you said, ah, not everyone can be taken into the future. But I'd love to open this up. We have 10 more minutes for questions or comments. Anyone has questions? No, yes? Okay, then let me let me take this uh, a little bit further. Um, when you said words are bloated and images are dead, is this like your attempt to bring back language into the image, in a sense, in your work? Um, I think it's more of an attempt to figure out what things are vis uh, like how their relationship are vis-a-vis -vis to each other these days. Because everything, as we talked about before, how images are like not like before anymore. There's no one images these days that can have a huge impact on somebody's life as the images from before. So I'm really interested to see how we can even like maybe rebuild this relationship. To the language, you mean? Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I, had, I wanted to go more into the forms that you are using. And you know, there is the pop element, but there's also the very traditional dance, which is the silent element. And so how do you see, uh, like I'm thinking about Nouriad and that performance in particular and how beautiful it was. Like it had so much affect, but we couldn't see the men singing. We could only hear them singing. So like wh what is your relationship to affect basically? I don't know. I think. It really changes a lot. I think my relation to it really changes a lot depending on how I'm feeling and depending on how I think I want the, the idea to be expressed or to be shown. And um, the the Nouriad piece, Ghosts of Today and Tomorrow, they're meant to be, they were meant to be this ephemeral element to the performers. There was a window to them so you can access them, but there was, um, the, the parts of them was in, inaccessible, and I wanted that to be very true, or to exist, or to have to have its own space. And it was more about as well the context with within which with, like the performance is also happening, who's around you, what's happening around you, and the wadi that it was happening within, like wadi Hanifa in itself. So I I attempted to make all these things like speak to each other in some way. And it's interesting, I felt like that was the least mediated of your works I had ever seen, like it really needs to be experienced live. Oh, we have one question, great. I was starting to get worried. Thanks, um, I, had, I have a question about uh, time. Um, so you're uh, relatively a younger artist and you came of age in this new Saudi that we are all observing. And, sorry? Okay. Um, so you came of age during this new era where Saudi is a very fast place, and for a long time Saudi was not that, it was, thing, it was a bit slower. And I just wanted to know how you think about what are your relationship of your practice to time, and whether you think it's easier, harder, different, being in a Saudi that's changing very quickly, and you could speculate whether if you were making work 15 years ago, would that have been easier, harder, more challenging, or there's another dimension in this axis? Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, the speed at which things are moving now is quite overwhelming. And I think, Nadine, you kind of mentioned it a bit, that when, when you think of change, you're always left with the residue of change. You're never really, you're, you never really touch it. You're just left with the aftermath of it. And it's the same thing with the future. You never really touch the future. You're always left with the residue of the future. And I feel like now more than ever, I've accepted my fate. <laughs> In, in regards to, in in regards to the future i've accepted that i'm part part of maybe the foundation of what's to come and i'm not really part of that future and maybe other people will be part of other foundations and um it's it's a thing that i'm qu constantly questioning within my work but in regards to the slowness of and the speed of the pace of how it kind of moved i think if you think of the context like if you think of saudi in general there's different generations that have lived different types of changes, and we're all living amongst each other, existing in our own kind of dimensions. And I think parts of everybody's experience, like my grandmother in relation to my mother, in relation to me, is all like intertwined in one another in some way. I actually want to go off topic for a second. Um, I actually collaborated with Mona too. Yeah. Um, we made, um, we tried to make works with our moms. 
So like, um, my mom, she's now retired, but now she's like practicing all this like traditional Chinese calligraphy and painting. And her mom does a lot of, her mom is a microbiologist and she actually made a lot of photographs of the, this kind of microbiotic um, images. So we wanted to, we apply for like a booth to sell our mom's works. Um, but they rejected us, so <laughs> so if anybody still wants to take their proposal. <laughs> okay, we have time for one last uh, question or comment. Two minutes. Okay, there's someone in the back. Um, it's, it's enjoyable listening to you talk about your work, uh, but some artists like to talk about their work and some don't. Do you find talking about your work helps or hinders? Uh, people's appreciation of your work. It, it wasn't always the case that artists would talk as much about their work as they do in the last 20 years. There's been an explosion of communication about work. I'm just wondering how you find that that changes uh, or, or, or how that might change. I think it definitely helps for me because most of my practice starts with text. Like whichever work it is, I will like start writing the text first and then everything else comes later and Sam with like talk even like talking about it later it helps me like process what I made. I think for me the work is the work. I think however people want to react to it or respond to it is I'm happy for them to take it how they want, but I think there's a certain like storyline that I want to set out and speaking about it sometimes helps kind of define that those kind of storylines for me. Yeah, and, and we are kind of talking about narrative today. I, with that, thank you very much and I'll hand over the floor to the next guest.